My name is Derek Sivers, and this is a panel with four completely different viewpoints on the subject of business innovation and the laws that help or hurt the goal of making a legitimate digital music marketplace. So before we get into the real discussion, let's give each person a few minutes to tell their tale about their interest in this subject. Peter, I'm going to start with you. This is uh, Peter Jenner, second one from your left, an absolute legend. <laughs> He's the manager, or was the manager of Pink Floyd, The Clash, Ian Drury, Robin Hitchcock, and now Billy Bragg for 25 years, he said, right? Yep. He's the emeritus president of International Music Managers Forum. He's an awesome advocate for musicians' rights, and the Future of Music Coalition is lucky to count him as a friend in the fight. So Peter, can you please tell everyone about the music access charge and what's going on in Isle of Man? Now, the Isle of Man is a very small island, not to be confused with the Isle of Wight. Now, the Isle of Man is it's a place somewhere in between Ireland, Scotland, and England, and is a, an independent state whose head of state is the Queen, how very quaint. But it has its own parliament, it has its own copyright law. It's sort of part of the UK, and it's sort of part of the EU, but isn't really part of either. So it can decide what it wants to do. And um, they're trying to work out what to do about the whole digital situation. Historically, the Isle of Man had um, two, historically they had one that they were fishing. It was a fishing uh, island. And then as the fish stocks got fished out and uh, fishing wasn't very attractive, they had a, 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 a um, motor bicycle race called the Isle of Man TT, which was their big thing, and tourism. That all sort of went a bit pear-shaped. Then they'd always been a, um, a rather dubious tax haven, and then they got caught out on all that, so they had to clean up their act a bit, and they just became a, uh, a very sort of a friendly tax um, position for offshore uh, companies and became big in banking. Uh, then uh, they built up a whole, because of the banking, they built up their interconnected, their inter internet thing, so they have very good connectivity, and they got into offshore gambling. Then the financial crisis struck and suddenly uh, banking looked like a less good proposition. So looking around, they thought, what other things did dubious people do apart from banking and gambling? And naturally, their minds turned to music. Um, so it, they seemed, I think, that or I've suggested that they really had three choices to what to do about music and online and using their connectivity. They're very good uh, internet services they've got and, and telephones. Um, and it seemed to me that, that, that the, anyone thinking about what they should do starting from scratch has really got uh, ab initio, as it were. I've got a th so three choices, I think. You can sit there and do nothing. And this is what I've said to the British government in my time, much to uh, their amusement. You've got, <coughs> you've got three choices. You can sit there and do nothing and watch the economy about the Internet. You can watch the economy of the content industries uh, decline and or implode. And then you can increase litigation, um, and then the nothing, and then all of that doesn't work because people find their ways around it or ignore it, and everybody goes into encryption. So really, you can't really do nothing unless you, again, have three choices. You can just let it die, you can pay for it out of taxation, or you can fix it. So in, in Europe, there's the do-nothing school, the next school, and this is uh, led by our friends across the channel, the French, is the three strikes and you're out rule, which says that the internet provider has to say, uh, oh, someone has to find out who's being naughty. The internet provider then has to send a note saying you're being naughty, and then um, you, you, beha you start behaving. If you don't behave, you get another note saying you're very naughty, and then the third time you do it, you get cut off. And as the Minister of Justice in Germany said the other day, they're just waiting for that to happen in France to hear the squeals in Berlin. Um, so I think the general feeling is that the three strikes policy is not going to work. People will find their way around it and um, that all it will mean people will run around with even more memory sticks, uh, swapped hard drives and encrypted 
And I think the encryption thing is what's really going to kill it because all these spooks are going to really hate it if all the music files currently blocking up the internet going around being encrypted files, the, in, the uh, security services are going to go mad. I don't think anyone's thought of asking them about that. So the third possibility, it seems to me, then is some form of access charge. And that's what we're suggesting at the Isle of Man. So back to the Isle of Man, they have come to conclusion that some sort of access charge might be a good idea. It might be a good idea because if they can solve the present conundrums, the three choices I put up at the beginning, this is the third choice, that the possibilities for them are very interesting because number one, in itself, it could be a good business. Number two, if it's legal to uh, access music um, in some way, then it has becomes very uh, interesting to see how that works, the, the idea in general terms, just as a sort of a, a sample, as a, a, as a test case. But the other thing is if it does work and it survives, then for anyone doing an internet service, not necessarily the ISP, but anyone who's got any ideas like YouTube or so on, originally had, they don't need any help, but any new ideas, they might better come to the Isle of White, Isle of Man, you see, even I do it, come to the Isle of Man and see whether it works um, and what happens. And so if that was to happen, given their very good tax situation, those services might base themselves in Europe. And generally, the experience that was gained from doing it in the Isle of Man might provide a possibility for business to be built out through Europe for doing this sort of basic um, access charge idea. The idea of the access charge originally, as I put it to them, coming from various discussions, not least with Jim, Jim Griffin, was it basically should be some sort of covenant not to sue. In other words, that there should be some deal between the, re the record industry or the music industry, sorry, the music industry more broadly, with an ISP saying, we won't sue if you give us some money, uh, basically. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's more or less the, the situation. A, a subsequent suggestion which has come come in and I think is the way that the Isle of Man probably will go is it in a way it's more, more illuminating, it's more interesting. It's saying to the ISPs, we will, um, we will reinforce your, your um, safe harbor and we will make it so that we t get rid of a lot of the ambiguity into all the safe harbor legislation so and get rid of a lot of the grief that there's always sort of hovering around and the potential actual grief. And in return for that, and return for you being able to use music as part of your service, you will pay the music community, we discuss that in a second, um, and that should be quite a hoot, um, we'll pay the music community a charge per customer. And this is very interesting, they have a very high, you know, have more, they, they have a very high rate of um, internet broadband connectivity and it's pretty good, and they've got very good phone systems with a very advanced by European standards of 3G phone service. And interestingly, the telephone company is called Manx Telecom that controls both, and they also do IPTV, and they provide uh, mobile lines, fixed lines as well. So they're into the, the whole game. And they are owned by O2, which is a very big UK company, which in turn is owned by Telefonica, which is one of the three or four biggest uh, worldwide phone companies, mobile phone companies. So they're, they're very interested in the whole idea. So the idea is that they would be paid and it would be negotiated what the rate would be. It would probably be somewhere between one and two pounds. There would be behind it some sort of statutory obligation, I, I, whether actually it would need to be uh, legislated or just threatened. But quite clearly, the Isle of Man are saying that this is the deal that they recommend that the ISP wants to do and if the music industry isn't willing to go on it, they're it's just going to be, you know, the money is going to get paid and then they can see what they want to do. So at that point, then I think that what's needed is that the, the, um, the next thing that we will have to get together is some sort of legislation which sort of says that the, with, with um, what do they call them? They call them uh, the... Um, Basically, that th they don't actually go into all the details, but they have uh, residual rights. The, the, the legislation would be uh, sort of uh, enabling, that's what it's called, enabling legislation, which says that we will better do A, B, and C 
if you don't get it together yourselves. In other words, to give a mighty stick to the music industry to get themselves together and resolve the issue so that a deal could be done. In other words, they have to pay for the content. They have to start paying for content, the ISPs, in a way that is acceptable to them, and the, uh, and the music industry has to accept the payment, or else they needn't if they don't like, but it's going to be very hard for them to sue. The idea, though, is that there is no removal of their life. It is not a license. There's no change in their statutory position, but in, in UK law and the Isle of Man law, they're going to have a very hard problem suing anyone if the ISPs don't have to provide any information and if that they've got to prove damages when they're turning down money which is being offered to them. So I think it, ha it effectively legalizes um, or decriminalizes, perhaps in the sort of mealy-mouthed words, it decriminalizes the vicious piracy which we've heard so much about earlier on this afternoon. Um, I think it's a very interesting thing because then it leads on to where does it go from there? Well, the idea is to build up uh, various services on top of that basic um, access charge because um, maybe we should go into that later. But that, the idea is that that does not stop iTunes or YouTube or any of the other services, but they too would be expected to probably the... the, the uh, content owners would still have their deals with them and they would still have to be dealt with. In other words, the, the, the services would not be getting away free. The distribution companies would be paying for and would not have to be, have any obligation to shut off anyone who might be providing unlicensed material. And I think the idea that then is a, it forces the music industry to, as it were, deal with a price for music. It seems to me the whole of the, what I saw of the last panel was about people not being able to, squabbling over how they would chop up the, 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 the monies. And it seems to me that that is not the problem of the ISPs. It is not, not their problem. Their problem is to pay for music. It's the music industry's problem to work out how they're going to, to, to chop it up. And if they can't come to some sensible solution, we'll have to find some third party who will decide how to chop it up. And that will be whoever it is, a judge, a regulator, or whatever. Or maybe we might become grown-ups and might be able to decide on a reasonably sensible basis for resolving the issues. Hopefully leaving everyone being treated in a similarly fair manner, rather than some of the big boys going in taking loads of money. And equally, it would enable new services to grow and develop and to find a place where they could license their music, at least in the Isle of Man. And, but hopefully, if the example works well, it will start rolling out through Europe and then elsewhere. In short, copyright has to be changed. Copyright cannot digitally rely on its traditional way. It, to me, it has to become, a remu in effect, a remuneration right. It has to be a, uh, an obligation that services which make money from directly or indirectly distributing music have to pay some sort of moderate amount of money uh, which reflects the value that is being added to what they're doing above and beyond their technology and their, or their other overhead costs. So, in other words, that is a, a sensible discussion to have, to be arguing about whether it's a download or a stream or a sync or a mechanical or a performance is something which should not concern any sensible third party. Thanks, I'll Peter. Leave it there. <laughs> Peter Jenner. <laughs> and in the red baseball hat, Alec, I know you're going to be tempted to just say ditto. But uh, from the incredibly successful and beloved band, Clap Your Hands, Say Yeah, Alec Owensworth, wildly, uh, widely heralded as a great do-it-yourself independent success story, uh, most people see you as an example of how it looks when it's all done right. At least that's the way I've always heard you guys mentioned over the past few years. So Alec, whether that's true or not, <laughs> why and how did the band arrive at such a business model? Was it deliberate or accident? Oh. Funny that funny that you asked that question. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, Peter and I were discussing this just moments ago. Uh, the idea of arriving at such a business model, uh, and 
I, I would like to sort of uh, to imagine that it was uh, purely independent. I think it was. Uh, all of the decisions that we made at that time, the initial stages were um, done without anybody breathing down our necks and uh, without any implications. I mean, we all had, uh, had jobs at the time and the simple goal was to put a record together. Um, I think that we benefited uh, primarily from really, and I was, I was mentioning this earlier, uh, from my own stubbornness to deal with the music industry. I think uh, uh, if there is a choice to do something like release a record um, independently, <coughs> a creative venture independently, then I think you should seize upon that choice. Uh, um, as far as arriving at this business model, initially we, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's relatively unprecedented. Um, at least that's what I've been told. And uh, so there was no guide specifically um, beyond intuition, really. And uh, and I like to imagine that some of the decisions that I've made as far as this project is concerned over the year and some creative decisions as far as the music on the record, uh, on the records uh, is concerned are, you know, primarily creative, intuitive decisions. I think that's how I'll continue making business decisions into the future unless, until I'm proven wrong, I guess. Yeah. Cool. But I don't have too much to say beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Alec. Uh, David Beal, currently president of National Geographic Entertainment, formerly president of National Geographic Music and Radio, formerly president of Palm Pictures, working with Chris Blackwell, founder at Ireland Records, formerly CEO of technology company Blue Tape, formerly class president of South Springfield High. Uh, <laughs> he's a musician himself, as you can tell just by looking at him. He just launched a new record label, Nat Geo Music, to record, release, and promote contemporary music from around the world. So David, since this panel is about laws that are hindering the development of business models, could you tell us about some of the snags you hit in setting up your integrated, uh, integrated TV web label thing? Sure, well when we, um, you know, everybody, uh, I mentioned that, that Crane's headline earlier, when we set out to do this, you know, everybody said, what are you gonna do, start a publishing company? You know, because we're on both sides of the fence here at National Geographic. I mean, we, uh, some of you may have seen, we just, we announced a publishing uh, worldwide administration deal with Cobalt. So we own many copyrights. We, we have about 17,000 um, music cues in our library for, so on one side, we're the publisher who wants to go out and have all these laws to exploit these things and make as much money as possible. Um, and and hence also with the label. But what we really see, you know, on one side being a, a copyright, you know, controlling copyrights, on the other side, we're a consumer brand. And, you know, we reach about 360 to 365 million people a month between our TV channels, our magazines, all the different things. So there's so many opportunities, you know, it's, it's great to own content, but it's also fantastic to provide, a, we've always, you know, National Geographic is a mission-driven organization that we're, we're sort of here to be, inspire people to care about the planet and be a doorway to the world, really, for a dialogue and artists and all these things. So we can, we can, by providing a great experience for our consumers and our audience, that's equally as valid to us as owning and exploiting content. And, and so we didn't set out to start a record label or start a publishing company or start a TV channel. We said, you know, clean slate, what would be you know, the ideal blue sky, perfect blue sky world, what would we do, you know? And we wanted to create sort of an integrated music experience, which I, I still hope that someday we, we realize this, meaning, you know, when you look at all of our platforms, if you have magazines that go out to all these people, you should be able to bundle, you know, magazines are gonna go digital, you know, magazines are definitely gonna get into e-readers and all that, so there's gonna be a lot of, lot of music out there and music subscriptions and that. You know, everybody's talked about the, the music industry being, um, you know, would the subscription model ever work in that? Well, magazines have always been a subscription model, you know, so the, they're, they're masters at the subscription model. And yet, on the other side, so we thought, you know, if you're going to launch a TV channel around the world, you're going to, you know, we want to give artists the opportunity and, and bring new artists to the audience. But then, you know, if somebody's sitting in Italy, 
And um, you know, when they see one of our bands, BB Tonga, where did they buy BB Tonga in Italy? You know, I mean, so and there is no no unified global distribution of or place that people know they can go and find all these things. On the other hand, we shoot shows, so we get audiences for the shows, as you saw the geo sessions. You know, most publishers say, well, we don't do gratis licenses anymore for, for publishing, for promotion. But by the way, you can't sell this. So, you know, because you got to have a sync license. So the artist goes, great, I got a new record, I want to be on your show. Publisher says, well, wait a minute, we don't grant you a gratis license, but you can't sell this because the record company says, well, we don't want you to sell that because we want to sell the thing that we're actually promoting, which is why we're putting you on the show. So. Uh, as you know, basically what what Peter was saying is it's that catch twenty two of you know wait, our idea is we find a great piece of content, you know whether it's an artist um, you know somewhere in the world who has a record deal doesn't have a record deal whether it's something somebody submitted along the way, and or maybe it's something that we've put together that actually creates a a new uh, you know a new type of thing which is what we were talking about earlier with um, you know which was one of the the big challenges. When I first got into this this position, uh, there was a one of the first things that was drawn to my attention in these legal meetings was that, you know, and especially now, by the way, before I before I tell you that one, we um, in launching a channel. Remember, what is a channel now? I mean, we have Nat Geo Music. It launched out of Italy. It's now in places as diverse from Turkey, Nigeria. I mean, all over these different places, but in one platform. They say, well, we can get you into the IPTV platform. And another, they'll say, we can get you onto you know, the digital cable platform. And another, they'll put you on the mobile platform. And they're all different rights packages. And they're all, and, and one will be a linear broadcast, and one will be an on demand process. We just, we have these people sitting there programming great music. We just want to get it out there. So if, it, if it's going to be on demand in one place and streamed in another place over the web and broadcast in another over a satellite, to us, it's, it's not geo music. It's just great programming. And, and also, when you see it, we'd love, no matter what platform you're seeing it on, what, it, even if we have nothing to do with the content other than we put it on the air, we'd love for you to be able to go, wow, I love that band. I want to buy it and, and be able to buy it and, and have the band monetize it. But, so I think that, you know, and which brings me to the, the thing that we were discussing, which is that, you know, when I first got into this, we sat in all these legal meetings and we said, okay, well, how do you draw the line? If you want to put this up on a bird and make it available all over the world on all these platforms, who do you actually have to make a deal with? And that's been unbelievable. I mean, there's a team sitting in the back that I can see them all cringing because they all sat through all these meetings trying to figure it out. And, you know, and then so in the legal meetings, it was brought to our attention, we started looking at the places out there where our content is illegally as a publisher or as a video rights holder. So one of the things that came to our attention, because uh, in my role I also oversee film, we have uh, uh, two fantastic e explorers. They're some of the world's foremost lion experts, the Joberts, and they had a film uh, called Lions of Darkness, and we're doing a new film with them right now uh, called The Pride. And you know they sit out there and they shoot lions. It's, lions are their life, you know. But you go on the web and you put in lions versus hyenas, you get the Jobert's film synced to the Beastie Boys, Prodigy, all these different bands, you know, Ashley Bosley and and you know, and you can even read the blogs where the guy says, "Hey, I was just an unknown guy in my bedroom, and now I'm well known all over the internet because I <laughs> created this great thing." Now we think it's fantastic. I mean, I think the editing could be better. No criticism, <laughs> but. <laughs> But you know the inspiration for that was fantastic. But there's no even if we thought it was great, and we happen to own the film content, so there's no way we could have gone out and created that or enabled you know even though now it's already been created and now that it's everywhere, it would be great to say hey even if nobody's gonna make money off it, save the lions or you know donate some money to save them. But there's nobody can monetize it because there's no licenses. You can't take it down. I mean you you could chase it all over the web everywhere. And yet the filmmakers who really actually created the initial inspiration for it, they go, that's cool, that's fantastic. You know, in our new movie, we should do things like that. So, so when you look at the new opportunities that are out there, which is, are the things that the audiences are, are really creating, and whether we create it, whether, you know, there really needs to be, be a, a centralized place, as you were sort of saying, where it's not this sink and that sink, and you know, there has to be a mechanism that that people can go out and create um, and and 
sort of get beyond the sync barriers and the broadcast barriers and all that, and so that these things can actually be monetized and people can actually use them. I, I mean, I've, I'm a firm believer in protecting sort of the first right of release. Um, obviously, if I write a song and I haven't put it out yet, it, um, it should be my song until I choose to do so. But sort of once I launch it into the ethos, it, it sort of becomes um, something that that um, I really feel then then sort of becomes part of the collective and I should still benefit from it, but we need to have the ability because that'll make it easier to go out and create all these other things. As I said, to my knowledge today, for all the things we've created, not one publisher has actually said to us, you know, they all say, by the way, we don't want to grant you a gratis promotional license for this, but not one has ever said you can sell this. So, you know, as we, you know, we can get the promotional sync license but that, that they want to be paid for, but they don't want us to sell a geo session, which would actually mean we could make money off it if we could so that we could actually pay them, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an interesting um, dilemma. Cool. Thanks, David. All right, Justin, I saved you for last because uh, if you guys look at your program and um, describing the actual, uh, the paragraph that describes what this panel is about, Justin's kind of a poster child for this panel topic. Justin, uh, quit his job as a male model, turned his back on the Calvin Klein underwear ads, pun intended, and decided to make Mux tape. Uh, I'm just kidding, he's not a model. I wasn't sure if anybody <laughs> would think that was funny. Um, <laughs> just, uh, Justin, can you uh, give a quick overview of the original Mux tape, uh, the story, and what happened? Sure. I don't see why that's impossible. I don't know. <laughs> is, there any, uh, is there anyone here who is a Mux tape user? Anyone in the room? A couple? Some of the younger folk? Um, so Muxtape was a website that I made in uh, March 2008. And it was, um, initially just, uh, it was initially just a design project. And what it amounted to was a very simple website where you could uh, create um, kind of the internet analogy of uh, a mixtape. I kind of uh, came of age in the 90s and um, at the height of mixtape culture, and for me, that was uh, kind of the first, um, kind of the first model for music discovery that I, you know, took part in, and I think a lot of people my age did, um, sharing music on tapes and discovering new bands that way. And so I was kind of looking at the internet and what's going on with the music, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of systems that rely on the massive gathering of data or like massively available pools of, of information or, or or content or whatever it may be. And I kind of said, you know, this isn't this isn't much like it was in the 90s, back when, you know, the limitations were uh, how long the tape was, you know, like the music that you had just available, like your records and CDs and, and your collection. And they said there were a lot of cool things about that. There's a lot of cool things about infinite, infinite pools of information, but uh, there's a lot of cool things about being limited to the length of a tape and uh, to what you have available to you uh, at the moment. And so I said, hey, this is a cool model. Um, let's try to uh, kind of bring it back. And so I made the site initially as just a way to kind of like um, just share what I was listening to with my friends. Like I had a, had a blog and I was like, I want to, I just want to share, you know, what I'm listening to. I want to create the internet equivalent of a mixtape. And it kind of snowballed very quickly into a thing where um, anybody could, could do the same thing and they were interconnected um, and launched the site very quickly uh, became very popular, and I started hearing from all different kinds of people, um, including some of the people at the table here earlier at the last panel. Um, <laughs> not me. Not Peter. Um, but I was, I was very surprised at the reaction. It was, it, was, it, was a very, uh, it was a very exciting time for me because the site was so popular, but also because um, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't planned. It wasn't, it was, it wasn't your typical kind of like, uh, it wasn't even supposed to be a business, really. It was, uh, it was just a, you know, it was just a project. It was just a, something that I wanted to do to see if I could further music some, somehow on the internet. And so all these things started to happen and there was, uh, there was so much interest from so many different you know, types of people. There were so many people involved in music um, with all different kinds of interests and they all, they all had varying opinions. And so immediately I started working on, um, on licensing the music. I knew, I knew right away that it was, it was not sustainable you know, as it was and that there were a lot of people who, uh, who had a stake in, in what was going on. And so uh, for about six months, um, 
I was working on the site and also uh, working on a licensing deal and um, wound up walking away from it. And uh, for a couple reasons. The most immediate one was that the, uh, my servers were taken down at the request of the, uh, the RIAA. Um, but more importantly, uh, it, the licensing process had reached a point where it, it, I just decided it was, it was too costly and, and uh, even more important than that, too complicated. And um, I, decided to, uh, I decided to walk away and, and, uh, and totally change the function of the site. So uh, what we're doing now is um, something similar. I'm still interested in, uh, in, uh, in music discovery and in, in promoting new music. And so what we're developing now is a system for, uh, for bands to promote themselves on the internet. It's, it's a platform that's uh, much simpler and uh, has a great deal more clarity than similar systems like it. There's a lot of different ways for artists to get on the internet, but uh, kind of one thing we identified with, with bands in general, um, clap your hands notwithstanding, is that you know, they're not all familiar with, with business at all. Like they should be thinking about music and not about the, you know, the business of music and also not about the technology of music. It's, it's just as important now. It's like, there's a, lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of bands on the internet and there's a lot of bands who aren't, and a lot of bands who aren't doing it very well or maybe not as well as they could uh, because it's complicated. The internet's, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot going on there technologically, there's a lot going on there systematically, and there's a lot of things that I feel like maybe I understand that bands don't that we can kind of, you know, help them with, hopefully. So it's a similar system, a lot different. There's no more music being uploaded. There's no, there's no more licensing issues. But it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a new world. Cool. Thanks, Justin. All right, so now let's, uh, let's turn this into more of a, an even discussion. So even if I direct the question at one person, uh, David, Peter, Alec, Justin, any of you, feel free to jump in. Um, let's see, where should we start? Uh, if you were to make one change, this is for any of you. You had a, you found Aladdin's lamp, you know, you rub it, the genie comes out, you use up the first two wishes on uh, securing your eternal happiness. You've got one left and you say, hey, policy change. Uh, what one change <laughs> would you make? Uh, what law do you, do you think it's the, would be the most important change that would be the most helpful for any of your progress or business? Jump in, whoever's got something to say. I would, I would uh, say that I think that uh, online use of music should be a remuneration right and not an exclusive right. I think the whole problems, well not the whole, but an awful lot of the problems on online as the, the problems of exclusive rights requiring you to get the permission of the rights owner. I think there should be an obligation for you to pay a proportionate amount of money for the use of that music um, and you should just be able to use it just as anyone who wants to make a recording of a song if they pay the appropriate statutory rate can put on a song. And I think that would be the thing which would open up the internet for all, for everyone and for lots of services would be the key number one issue. Get rid of exclusive rights de facto. Uh, de jure, they can still, in other words, as a matter of law, they can still hang around there. But just as in radio, we don't, you don't have to go and get an exclusive right for a performance on radio. It's just, you don't have to get an exclusive uh, special license for uh, performance of a song on a record. It's a ridiculous setup at the moment. Thanks. Anybody else? And I agree with that, by the way. <laughs> I will also agree with that. <laughs> well, so Justin, I, you know, when I was reading your story, and by the way, there's a, a longer version of that story you told uh, on his website that's really kind of fascinating. Is it muxtape.com slash story, right? I think. Yeah, that's it. There's, I mean, there's a lot more to it. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's it's a it's a good read if you're up, if you're interested. So when I was reading this history of you starting the company, one thing I couldn't help but wonder is getting into the mindset of somebody starting a new music site, doing something that's kind of you're not sure if it's legal or not. It might be, it might not be. Not clearly uh, illegal, immoral, and harmful like autotune, but on the uh, <laughs> debatable edge. So, Justin, what was your mindset when you were starting this? What were you hoping would happen? I mean, I think. Uh, more than anything else, I was hoping that that I would cause people to buy some music, or at, at the very least, discover discover some new music um, that they they wouldn't have otherwise at all. And I think in that sense, I was successful. I, like just anecdotally, people have told me, you know, like uh, there are lots, even even myself. Like I love the site, and I miss it a lot because it was a great way to discover new music. And I think that the first 
step towards buying some music is knowing that it's there and that you like it and that you know we rely on you know people hearing that music in, in some form or another initially whether it be on the radio or you know in a TV show or, or whatever it is on the internet um, so I mean that was my mindset it definitely uh, it wasn't it wasn't a case like I'm not an anarchist I've been a, I've been accused of that <laughs> or of being like a pirate or you know equating it to Napster or something else and, and I don't think that's true it, it it's more like um, I was thinking, you know, hey, let's see what can be done and just, you know, and, and work it out later. It's like if it's successful as as a model for uh, discovering new music, and I can convince people of that, uh, you know, mainly the record labels, then maybe we could move forward with it. And ultimately, that was true. It was like I I moved forward with the record labels in a way where it was clear that they were interested in it. It wasn't an issue where I came in there and they were just like, you know, we're going to shut you down right now, and you know and it's over, it was, hey, you know, like, we see what we're doing, we wish you'd come to us first before you launched it so we could talk about it, um, which couldn't have happened for, you know, a number of reasons, but, um, I mean, yeah, that's it, I mean, that, that, was, that was my hope, and, um, you know, in some ways it was a success, in that mm -hmm. sense. Cool. It, it seems kind of like, uh, and again, Justin, this is kind of directed at you, but really anybody um, jump in, because I'm curious about the opinions, it seems like, you know, you look at the, the original Napster, I meme, Mux Tape, they've all created something that was really uh, beloved by the public. I mean, even, you know, the way I heard about Mux Tape the first time is there was some, I think it was in England somewhere, like a, a magazine was, they did a, a poll of the best music website, and, you know, everybody could submit their favorites, and the winner of the best music website of 2008, Mux Tape. I'm like, that's how I heard of them the first time. So it's like, there are these services that are on the, uh, the edge of legal or illegal that are really beloved, then they get a bunch of attention, they get to be the celebrated rebel when uh, Darth Vader comes and shuts you down, you're still the good guy. So it seems like a great career move, actually, um, like uh, sleeping with Winona Ryder in the 90s. Seems like <laughs> if you had to do it all over again, uh, would you do it any differently? Like if you had to go back to last March and do it again, would you do it any differently? I don't think I would. Um, I think that, like, there, you know, I think that the the record industry understands its business. I mean, maybe, <laughs> but you know, I think websites should kind of be left to web designers. Music should be left to musicians. You know, like, and that's that's you know, they they do it the best. And I think that like, if I'd gone to the record labels and like, you know, presented wireframes and a business model and a proposal and all these things, it would have never happened. Like, and and that's just not the way it worked. It, it wasn't. There wasn't anything. Like I said before, like premeditated about it, I, you know, it was like it was a design project, and it yeah. kind of turned into something else. So, you know, no, I wouldn't change it. And as far as a career move, it, it's like it, it, it just, you know, it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even a, it wasn't even a business. I mean, it, it just kind of turned into that out of necessity because there had to be some money involved to pay these licenses. And I was like, well, you know, if, I, if I'm if I'm if I'm really into this into this vision, um, I'm gonna have to make some money happen in order to keep it moving. It w that wasn't the primary goal. Okay. I mean, I think the idea that you have to make music, you have to make money for music, you see, in itself is offensive. I mean, I think if someone wants to put music out and it's great and they don't make money, good luck to them. I mean, I really don't see the problem. Um, it's not as if someone's taking your money. They're creating something for people to listen to. In the same way that if you come around to my house and I play you a record, you know, I don't expect to have someone coming knocking on my door and asking for money. Now, I can see the argument that if I'm making money, I'm putting adverts on it, or I'm in some other way, directly or indirectly, making money. Then I can see the objection. But this incredibly anal position is... Hey, that's interesting. This incredible <laughs> anal position <laughs> that if you make music, you've got to pay for it. If you put up music for people to enjoy, you've got to pay for it. I think it's absolutely grotesque. I mean, if this guy is making tapes which people are enjoying and leading people to discover new music, we should all say thank you. We shouldn't shut him down. I mean, I just don't know what's going on in the head of these people. Uh, it's like that geezer from the radio station. I've got to have a go at the geezer <laughs> from the radio station. $65,000 was how much he had to pay for music. And what an outrageous amount of money that was. This was a guy who also said he was, pay he was earning $2 million on the station, only $2 million. And to get a DJ
CJ would cost him $40,000 plus all his health and other expenses. And we didn't ask him how much his electricity bill was or how much he paid to clean his studios. But the idea that $65,000 was a lot of money to pay for music, I, I nearly leapt out from there and ripped his throat out. Um, you know, so I'm not a sort of naive person who thinks that pe if there's money there, give the musicians and the creators some of the money. Absolutely. But don't stop them doing things. Don't stop people being creative. And don't whinge if you have to pay over some of the money you're making from exploiting music. Yeah. Less, end of lesson. <laughs> I, I agree. And from a, from a musician's perspective, when we were starting out, I was talking to my manager about this. I mean, initially, uh, we were so young and still are, I think, and naive and innocent uh, to a degree. Uh, and we, you know, uh, we released a record with no label. Everything went directly to us and through us. And uh, uh, we knew at the time that, you know, in, I don't know, in the first month, something like 50,000 downloads of the record had happened. And, you know, and we, we sold a fraction of that. And, I mean, frankly, I mean, it might still be, be naive. This is why I, I mentioned naivete and innocence is, is uh, any musician should be just honored and gracious that anybody's listening in the first place. That you make money is a secondary, you know, a secondary position, really. It goes back to what, uh, what Hank was saying, uh, Hank Shockley was saying earlier, um, where, uh, you know, somebody's in prison and, and says something like, uh, you know, your, your record changed my life, and that's, that's what a musician is really doing it for, honestly. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you don't, if you're not in it to try to make a great record, at least try to make a great record, and whatever comes of it, you know, whether you make money, that's fine. You know, that's the way we think. Anyway, um, if you make money, fine. If you don't, you know, what success is, is being satisfied with the record you made, and that's it. And that's what I've always told people, so. And it goes for this, you know, it goes for, you know, regarding the internet as well, and everything that goes along with it. <laughs> so, Alec, it sounds like technology hasn't been a, uh, a hindrance or a stumbling block for you in any way. You know, it's like oh. the, the way that this panel was described is kind of as if, uh, sorry, I mean like laws would be something that were holding you back. It sounds like you just used right. it to its best advantage, right? Well, I mean, in, in some other people would probably have a, a different opinion. Uh, I mean, the commonplace opinion is that uh, it is a hindrance by virtue of the fact that, you know, those 50,000 records, that could have been money for me, you know? But, you know, if we sold, I don't, I don't recall how many records we sold for the, on, the first, on the first album, um, but none of us were, we were living as musicians, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of what we wanted out of that. And we were making a living, you know, being musicians, and that was it. Um, as far as any, like, long-term goals, that we had or have, I mean, that's still kind of up in the air. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I mean, and that's that's the idea. I mean, you know, as I said, you make a record. If people like it, if they listen to it, that's that's the the main objective. You know, you know, and that might be innocent and naive still, but you know, I don't really care. <laughs> so. so, Alec, if you had to give advice to another artist. There, there was a, when I was researching uh, Alec before the panel, uh, I was, you know, doing my research online and Billboard magazine had put together a uh, eight steps on how to, uh, the, the lessons learned from clap your hands, say yeah. They came almost as like eight step how to do what they did. And, uh, and thanks Kristen for the link. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was things like, you know, number one, have your bass player be your webmaster. Uh, Right. Number two, right. uh, have David Bowie as a fan. Uh, right. right. So like that. But Alec, could you? Uh, well, what advice would you give to other artists who wanted to I mean, do what you've done? Uh, for one, for one thing, the internet provides everybody with the opportunity opportunity to really remain independent and keep things on their own terms to a large degree. Uh, everybody was uh, had a task, you know, when we started out. It was truly do it yourself from <clears throat> um, setting up a sort of PayPal method when the album was released um, to take orders from around the world 
to all of us packing uh, the CDs individually and in bulk to send around the world at the post office up the street. I mean, this is how we sold, I think, the first 30 to 40,000 records. Wow. And uh, I mean, uh, the advice I would give is to focus on the record, <laughs> you know, and that's pretty much it. Uh, the world is so small by virtue of the internet and all of these mechanisms, mechanisms which are provided um, that, you know, if you f focus on making what you consider a, a great record. Well, um, but let's go a step beyond that. What if a friend of yours, say a friend of yours living in uh, Philadelphia, made a brilliant record. He's just sitting at home and you listen to his album right. and you say, dude, it's genius. Yeah, what would yeah. you tell him to do next? <sighs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh... I mean, uh, what everybody's been doing for all this time, you go out and you, you hit the road and you do, you know, hope, hope to, that maybe people pick you up or maybe people listen to you. Um, you, know, uh, you know, genius records, I don't know. I think of not too many genius records, really, in the last hundred years or so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are, there, there are. Yeah, you know, there are quite a few. When I say not too many, I mean quite a few. <laughs> I'd say get a publicist. But, uh, mm -hmm. Sorry? I'd say hire a publicist. Really? For and, the first and, step. Uh, and get somebody, yeah, because that, this actually happened to me. It's, it's actually working for a friend oh, of mine. Yeah. But he played me the record, and he said, you know, what do you think of the record? And he immediately said, i got to get an attorney and go get a label. And I was no. like, no, get a publicist. And then they got a publicist, and suddenly when they were in all these magazines and newspapers, then suddenly they got a really good booking agent. And mm -hmm. Now they're on the road. And um, it's a kid's band. But it's, um, it's, it's actually been amazing to sort of just watch my own you know, thing, because I, I was just sort of by looking at our, you know, and I'd also get somebody who was really you know, younger, a, a passionate young fan to really go out on the web and, and help you if you're the band, because everybody has this great idea that artists are gonna come off the gig every night and post their own video and do all the things. And that works for some people, but most of them don't, right. you know? Put it on mux tape. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> if you're sitting on a genius record, I want it on mux tape. <laughs> It is the new, it's not, it's still It's not open yet. I mean, wait two months. No, it, if you're sitting on a genius record, bring it to Nat Geo Music. In the <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, David, I was wondering that. Is, is Nat Geo Music, I mean, is it open to artists from anywhere? Oh, definitely. Matt Whittington is sitting in the back um, who runs the label. And yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. And we honestly, we find, I mean, for all the, the people we know and the people who know about us and the press and things, through the TV channel, um, that has, you know, through Natural Music, the, the channel, they have scouts all over the world. And we get turned on to the stuff just like, and it's funny because half the time when we get it and we go, wow, that's phenomenal. Then we go look on YouTube, it's already on there, but nobody yeah. knows about it, you know? The one advice I would give to anyone is never assign a copyright. That's the most important advice. Never assign a copyright. I'm glad to hear a rustle of people writing that down. Never assign A-S-S-I-G-N a copyright. License it, and if you really have to, assign it for a very short time. But basically, never assign a copyright. That's 40 years in the music business distilled. <laughs> Actually, um, David, you were saying something about that backstage earlier, about how it seems like the publishers were a big stumbling block for you, that if it was just between you guys and the artists, everything would be a lot easier, and you almost were suggesting that if you were to talk to a brand new artist, you'd, you'd advise, do not sign a publishing deal at all. Yeah. Well, it, it depends on what you need, and, and also what, what type of thing you do. I mean, publishers, like, for instance, because we were doing that admin deal, we were shopping publishing for a while over the last two years. And, you know, if you've got songs and you need to go out and you want somebody hustling your songs and placing them and syncing them and putting them on commercials and all those, that's great. I mean, most people sign deals early on when they don't know what they need. And, you know, and, and so I can tell you just from our perspective of being in the business, you know, it, and, and this actually goes back to my first manager in the business when I was a drummer. And um, Principal Mambo, you know, Principal manages you too. And they had uh, Karen Kaplan oh, yeah. um, has, had Mambo on the side. So they were my first manager in the business. 
and Ellen Darst, who was one of the MTV people eventually. Um, they got me my first gig. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. But, you know, it was very funny because I was talking to them about why I needed a manager. And they said, no, actually, you don't. And I said, well, I need a manager to get me gigs because I was out there, you know, touring with all these bands and records and everything. And they said, if you need a manager to get you gigs, you don't need a manager. They said, you know, what a manager actually does is, is sort of guides you through making the right decisions. You know, you know, managers aren't there to get you work and go out and find your work because, you know, to be effective when you actually need a manager, you really need to have more of a basis for that um, or you're going to get in a bad situation early on. And I think that when, when artists come to us, I mean, what we offer as a record company is we're not really a record company. I mean, we're a record company, but we're a big media company that has a passion about certain types of music and, and content, and we have a lot of opportunities. And so if, if somebody sort of fits into that, and you know, we have places to sell the music, to sync the music, to do all these things, we also have an amazing vehicle to publicize it. But maybe some, you know, there's a lot of artists out there who say, well, great, I don't have a deal. And I say, but you don't need me because you, you have, so it's really, but if you're, you know, like some of the bands that, that we're about to announce, we can really bring a lot to the table for them. And so I think that it's when you go out to, to look at these deals, really analyzing what do you need? You know, what do you want to get out of a label? And if our big problem is when we deal with the publishers and the other labels and everything, you know, a song is a song and an artist is an artist. And it's, it's one thing by the time it gets handed to us. But everybody that has their hand in the mix has a different agenda of what they want to get out of that song and what they want to get out of us. And so it, it gets to a point, I mean, We've been fortunate working with um, with the channel uh, that that they've hung in there and sort of slugged it out so far. Um, but the reality is that you know everybody goes great. A music channel has come along and they want our stuff. Now let's see how much money we can get out of them. You don't make money when you start a music channel. It costs millions and millions and millions of dollars to even get it going. I mean, just just on the software back end and the satellite feeds and all these kind of things. And, and yet the industry doesn't come in, you know, we really need to be there with a menu that goes, you know what, here's, a, here's music, and if you're gonna exploit it this way, you get this, if you're gonna exploit it this way, you get this, and encourage people to exploit it like crazy. I and mean, we wanna monetize it, but it's gotta be that simple because most people can't figure it out. And we even, even when we get a blanket license somewhere, they'll say, okay, well, we're able to make a deal over here and it's gonna grant us all these rights, but we should really go clear it with these people individually anyway, because we might get sued in there somewhere, you know, and it's more lawyers and, and meetings than anybody could even possibly, you know, dream of for the barriers against it. You know, right yeah. now, if you look at our website and you look at the amount of web traffic that National Geographic has, I mean, it's astronomical and the magazines go, oh, this is fantastic. We should feature all this music and put it up on the web and, you know, we can write an article about, about this and we can shout out this music and you can put it on the website and sell it and everything and I'll, usually we're going, yeah, we'll call us in a couple months because we don't have time this month to <laughs> just deal with all the bureaucracy we're going to have to go through to make some of those things possible. So, and you go to the, the and not to go on to this, but, you know, every, and then everybody goes, well, you have a, a music store on the web, so how are you going to compete with iTunes or how are you going to compete with Amazon? We have no interest in competing with iTunes or Amazon and every, anybody, and they don't have any interest in us. We're far too <laughs> small and esoteric for them. You know, the things that I want to feature on our websites, Amazon or iTunes, you know, you could, you know, pay all the money you want. They don't, they don't want it on the front of their site, you know, usually. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're there in trying to provide a unique editorial experience just like we've done in the magazines and, and just like we've done on, on television all over the world. And I think that it's it's really kind of a shame that if you think of the the barrier as a as a, you know when you, when media companies want to do this thing, it's almost like the industry does everything possible to stop them from doing it. Yeah. It's a rare moment of defense for the music industry. We do have to remember that they were horribly burnt by um, by uh, MTV. I mean. That, Absolutely, so, and that and, uh, scarred yeah. them. That scarred them in a horrible way. And if 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 you see music executives behaving in a disgusting manner, they probably look back and find that it was something to do with MTV. Peter, this is even news to me. What do you mean? And, How did they get I, burned by MTV? Uh, well, I mean, for for years they didn't get paid by MTV. 
MTV built a huge business on the basis of videos which were paid for by record companies, which were charged to artists. It was put up and MTV collected the, uh, any advertising revenue. If there wasn't advertising res revenue, they ended up selling MTV for God knows how much the record companies got not a bean. And it okay. took forever to get them to even pay a tiny bit towards it. And there were things like that which have sort of left a little a little scar or two okay. on the record company's psyche. And I'm yeah, sure and I don't that, want you to get the wrong idea that we're... Because as sure I said, we're on the what, other that's side That's what of they that. talked to you about. I'm right. sure they told you a lot about MTV when you tried to get it. Exactly. I hate to defend the record companies. <laughs> and and we are one, well, so it, well, trust me, yeah. we want to monetize all the things we have. I mean, you know, the publishing business is what pays our bills, you know. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. But, but it's that catch-22 because we go, we could do so much more if we had one place to really sit down and one forum well, to really cut through this, you know. I think that's what uh, it frustrates me so much about, the, about what's going on generally online with the record business. There's the potential, I'm sure, if we, were, if we went to the ISPs and the MSPs as people we would like to do business with rather than going to them as people who are stealing our money. It's not a good way to go in to say to people, you're stealing money for us, you're ripping me off, man. Now let's talk business. I mean, it's, you're getting off to a rather a bad start. If you go into them and say, hey, you're doing a great job of distributing our music. Now let's try and work out how we can develop our businesses together. Now that's a radical thought, together. And if furthermore, when we said we, we included all the music rights, and, and now this is getting really wacky, that we will include the musicians in it, <laughs> that we will actually pay the musicians for what the deal that we're doing with you. I mean, this is really radical thinking, but I think it might advance the whole game because I think one of the reasons why the record companies get so much trouble online is that it's got out. The public knows that they never give any of the money to the record, to the artists, that there is a... A, a classic lack of legitimacy and it's a traditional problem if a law does not have legitimacy it is very hard to enforce if you try and make uh, walking out in the street in the sunshine without an overcoat a crime you're going to find there's going to be a wave of crime in the summer <laughs> and that in a sense is what they're doing and they're not saying, what is the technology? What are the potentials of this technology that between us we can work out a sensible business together? Now, I'm quite sure that there are lots of ISPs who are complete, complete pigs who only want to rip everybody off. I'm sure those people exist, and I've got no mercy. They can do whatever they like to those people. But most of them can't be bothered. They just want to develop their businesses. They don't want to steal money from the artists. They're not pirates, nor are the customers who are getting stuff. They can't work out how they could pay. You know, most of the stuff on the, on, on the internet that they want to get, they can't pay for even if they wanted to. So you can't call them pirates. And it's being put up by other people who are doing it because they think this is a great song that people would like to hear. They're not pirates. So, I mean... I just find it unbelievable. I sit here in my advanced years and see this incredible opportunity for spreading music, for introducing people to new music, to uh, give people lots of fun, lots of entertainment, all the possibilities that are there on the net and all the music business can do is bitch and moan. I mean, I think it's amazing. And try and close things down. I mean, I don't know what mux tapes, I'm much too old much too, too lazy to find out what Mark State was about. <laughs> but I'm sure it was great. And I'm sure <laughs> it turned a lot of, because I saw your hands going up, and I'm sure it turned a lot of people onto a lot of good things. And I'm sure a lot of people went to gigs and bought records because of that. And yet some bunch of dickheads went and closed his, <laughs> went and closed his, his, his server down. I mean, what has got into them? What money did they get out of that? <laughs> How did it help them advance their business, closing down these opportunities? I don't understand it. But you know what? The, the one thing that, that came to 
when when I was talking earlier, I saw John Potter back there smirking. <laughs> oh, I'm going and, to see him tomorrow. Uh, He's going to like me now, you know. And it it actually brought something to mind. Years ago, he he convinced me to to come down to Washington before I had an office down here and, and testify at one of these copyright hearings. And I remember sitting there like for an entire day while we'd been through all these briefings, all these different things. And when it's finally the testimony was gone, there was this long extended period. A period where I'll leave the, test, the person testifying nameless, but was on about RAM buffering, whether it should be legal or not legal in a CD player. And I remember we were all sitting there waiting to give our testimony, and by the time we actually got to testify, I looked up at the panel, and every single person was nodding off and completely, I mean, half of them were sound asleep, and some of them were bordering on being asleep. And, <laughs> and what it made me realize was I said, wow, this is a really boring issue for these people. You know, they don't know what we're talking about. They have no idea what we're talking about. And so that night, we went out with some unnamed senators and staffers. And, and I said, why are you guys interested in this? Like, everybody was sleeping today. And I mean, what was, what was going on? And they said, well, it's a lot more fun than gun control and abortion. You know? <laughs> and, and that's when it kind of hit me that if we're going to really deal with any of these issues, we got to even find a way to even, you know, you can't, we can't have days of protracted discussions about, you know, if I broadcast a song, five songs in a row over a mobile phone, is that mobile radio or is that, you know, and yeah, I repeated these not? songs after three times. And by the way, it was in a RAM buffer, so I think it was actually a download and not a stream. And, you know, oh, no, I mean, I, what, I, I tell you, I've got another one. Was there an ephemeral copy? Right. Exactly. You know, there's an ephemeral right. copy that radio, everybody has to pay for an ephemeral copy. Does anyone here know what an ephemeral copy is? I think there was one hand went up. Yeah, she's just brushing her hair. That was a question. <laughs> Fine. But anyway, they, they skim money off of your sound exchange money because there's an ephemeral copy. What is it? Who knows? Yeah, there was one time, I don't know if you remember, uh, years ago on the far list, there, were, there was this kind of discussion, like, what is an ephemeral copy? What is this? And some smartass said, what is the artist? And uh, even better, somebody came up and said, the artist is the little rag doll that the RIAA shakes when they want to get some more money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, look at the little artist. Look. Look, he's sad. <laughs> Come on. Anyway. We should be having um, a lot of conversation about how we can sort out the metadata attached to recordings, both historically and going forward. Because if there's no metadata, with the best one in the world, no one can pay you. So if no one knows you're on the recording, you ain't going to get paid. If that, if that recording isn't played very much, you've got a very good chance of not getting played, paid. Because in, in my sort of environment, where I'm talking about with sort of uh, blanket licenses as, as, as a basic thing, unless it's coming through as some sort of hit, you've got a good chance it's not going to ever get picked up. There is no question. You might be lucky and get picked up and get paid 10 times as much money as you should do, but equally, in nine times out of those 10, you're not going to get picked up and you're not going to get paid. And there's, there's, that is bound to happen. Uh, and, and in the course of time, <laughs> one would hope that gets better. And I mean, I think that's a challenge that the industry has to face up to. But we also have to be very aware that the less information there is, the more likely it is that the, the major labels will get the money as it's chopped up on a market share basis out of the black box. And the black box is a scandalous operation which is used to uh, acquire money. And that is going on an awful lot at the moment with a lot of the digital deals, that they're just chopping money up on a sort of market share Does everybody share know basis. what black box royalties well, okay, are? Okay, basically, you, if you money that you can't, don't know who it's for, not by a collection society and, or, or a label, and it's allocated to them. You don't, it's not allocated to a track, but it's just paid out. There's some money we don't know who it belongs to, but you know we're paying X percent. Here's some money. We know that record was played so many times, and so on and so on and so on. And then there's some money left over in, in whatever way. That, that's called black box money, because you don't know who to pay it to. And often that money gets chopped up on market share basis more or less always to the majors. And there's elements, because of that, there is a, a, a temptation, which I'm sure is never indulged in deliberately, not to provide information. Because the more you don't provide information, the more money goes into the black box. 
And that the black box is all round collection society. Oh, I, <laughs> Anne, Anne disagrees with me. I'm probably telling you the truth. She's going to tell you what they should be doing. No, no, I, I, I'm just going to say for the session players and the session singers, there is a fund. It's the AFM yeah. After Intellectual Property Rights Distribution Fund. And they distribute to the side uh, musicians and the side singers. And they distribute whether or not it was a re union recording whether or not it was a union, your union member, that's just not relevant. If it was played, they'll distribute it to you. Now they get 5% from the money that Sound Exchange collects. 2.5% uh, goes to session players, 2.5% goes to session singers, um, and they get the data. So that's luckily not going into a black box that could otherwise go to the labels. Um, they also have arrangements. They take the um, Home Recording Act, mo Home Recording Rights Act money, and there's some deals. You know, in Japan, there's a Record Rental Act, and in Japan, 33% of the performers' money goes to the background um, players, and um, the fund distributes that money. They have a great website because identifying these people is really impossible. And um, that's they, the big problem, and, isn't and, and it? They, but the, the site is amazing. You have to go. I think it's www.raroyalties.org. It is okay. Raroyalties.org. And what they have there is you can look and you see, and they have all the records that are entitled to distributions. And they actually they get virtually no money. They do God's work with no money because they have to identify all these people. Mm -hmm. They have people listening and looking at the liner notes and going, I hear a violinist too, calling the trumpet player saying, who was the violinist? Wow. Then they post up what they have on there and they say for the record, so you can click and see, are, am I listed? Did I play on this record? If you're not listed, you can tell them. Do you know somebody who played on the record? And they're really trying to fill out the spot. So like the mandolin player, mm -hmm. if it's not there, you can point out. And so it's a very good two-way interactive site because identifying the session players is really difficult because the labels don't keep that information or won't keep that information. And um, so I think, the musicians are all working together to build yeah. that data. I think it's really important, and I'd also say apologies for, they certainly don't black box in that sort of context, but there really is a problem with older recordings, uh, just simply that people can't remember whether they're on that session or that session, or whether it was, the, I did a lot of sessions with that drummer, but was he on actually that one, or was he only on that one? So there are huge problems with, with historically. And it is something that going forward, we should all make a lot of effort, if you're doing a recording, to keep accurate records of the musicians and the performers and the singers who played on those recordings and try and register them with the appropriate people. Who, and if you don't know who they are, I certainly don't, but the uh, Future of Music Coalition will provide you with that information, I suspect, if you ask them very nicely. We have time for one more question from the audience, and then we're going to take one from our live webcast. Cool. Thanks. I just, um, it's interesting the sort of clash between the traditional ideas of how you make money and these new ideas about how to make really compelling web offerings. And I, I think that the labels and the content owners could learn a lot from these sort of wise guy sites or hobby sites that just put mm -hmm. something up. And I think, in a way, it's something I teach in my classes at Northeastern is this sort of a, an entrepreneurial attitude. It'd be really good if they sort of just envisioned the satisfying customer experience. You know, the fact you had 85 million people using Napster was an incredible opportunity for them to say, okay, so how can we make this work? And I think when you have a phenomenon like Mux Tape or something else, instead of crushing it, uh, look at this, okay, the customers like this. So let's figure this out. And anytime you have a lot of uh, activity around an idea, instead of saying, well, this violates our rights and it's not gonna work and we wanna shut this down, let the customer tell you how you what the next business model should be and sort of run the race backwards. And as the customer is doing something that, that, that people really like, then I think that should be a lesson for the content owners to figure out how to legitimize that and not necessarily through an exclusive rights idea, but you know, who are the players that on the who, who make this work, whether it's the ISPs or the MSPs or uh, you know uh, or uh, the, or universities, whatever it is, but just get all the different players who are conduits or touch points for this experience and get them to the table and figure out how we can make it work instead of 
approaching it from how do we exploit our portfolio, which I think is um, exactly the wrong way to run the race. So I think, you know, we end the race with the customer experience and then figure out how to build backwards a, a business model from that. And I think that, that uh, you guys are showing that to be, I think, the wave of the future. I think that the key, the two key people in any, in, in essential elements, the only two essential elements in a music market are the creators at one end and the users at the other. And the rest of us, including managers, have got to help and facilitate that relationship. And I think what has happened, or what is happening, or what has happened, or what perhaps will always happen, is that the people in the middle hijack most of the activity, whether it's the lawyers, the managers, the labels, the publishers, whatever, whatever, whatever. And, and we should always be aware that that's the important thing. It's that the, the, the way of transferring the information and, their, and perhaps money, the information from the creators to the consumers or the users, and finding a way for them to pay to get money back in a way that it feels right to them, rather than imposing things. And I think absolutely, if you see something's working well, work out how you can develop it in a way which keeps it going rather than killing it off. Yeah. There's a great book out right now called What Would Google Do? that uh, I highly recommend. Uh, it's, it's just in hardcover, it came out last month. So it's called What Would Google Do? And the author says that, you know, there's this real estate site that where you can just go uh, click to see what houses are available in your area and uh, what the what other ones were previously sold for and you can completely bypass the uh, the real estate broker. And Zillow. Zillow, is that it? Yeah. And he said, look, you know, take this kind of model that anybody who's in between these two ends, like you just said, here's the musician, here's the fan, uh, in any business, anybody in the middle, you're going to be made unnecessary at one point. Something's just going to automate you away. And, he's, and what I love is that as he's writing this, uh, he said, at this point in the book, my, uh, my editor called me. Or my, no, yeah, something like my, uh, my literary agent called me when she read this chapter and said, hey, are you saying that I'm unnecessary? And it's like, Tracy, I, I love you, but yeah, soon you're going to be unnecessary and uh, things like that. So anyway. Uh, well, I think okay. we all have a duty, Derek, to try and keep ourselves uh, to try and keep ourselves useful. <laughs> Otherwise, we're out of a job and have to get a proper job. For God's sake, yeah. I'm too old for a that proper job. <laughs> um, so we've been live webcasting today, and, and yeah. people have been using an online chat to try and uh, just learn a bit more. And there was a question posed, which is kind of a, an interesting question. Somebody said, what is a centralized meta database? What, what, what would it look like? What would it do? It's a good point of clarification. You know? Did anybody want to answer that? Uh, it would have to be a community-driven thing, wouldn't it? IMDb. Like an IMDb for music, right? It, I mean, yeah, I'd say would, a Wikipedia was, for music, kind sorry? of. Sorry? Kind of a Wikipedia for music. Well, or. yes, I mean, but I think what I was getting at is the idea that there's, there's, there's a body which people can pay the money to in any country for use on uh, a use of music online, and which would then distribute that knowing uh, and getting information from the people who paid as to where the money should be attributed to, what, what sort of titles, and then distributing that through the, copy, the existing copyright system, i.e. the labels, the performing societies, the publishers, and so on, in some agreed format. Uh, that is very roughly the, the idea that I would have, and that that could then perhaps also be a body that could conceivably negotiate a basic rate for, for the use of music on a site. And presumably all the major stakeholders in the creative process or, and the investment in that creative process would have to be shareholders in some way in that body. And it would have to be, and this is a really shocking statement, it would have to be a bit grown up. <laughs> okay, we have one wrap question for today. Here we go. Um, First of all, Alec, I know you did qualify your statement earlier, but there was a couple of records by a band called Pink Floyd in the past hundred years, so <laughs> in terms of genius records. Um, but, but <laughs> um, my question is, uh, I think um, culturally in America, um, in, we have this concept of, um, of artists and musicians are included in this, where we are, you know, it's like, yeah, you can make your art, but you know, you should get a real job too. And, and many artists do have quote unquote real jobs. And here, I think we're all gathered here trying to figure out, 
can there be this, what we're referring to as a musician middle class, this idea of healthcare and this idea of uh, a sustainable career and where the payment is coming in. And it's absolutely about the difference that you're making and the art that you're making, but it's also about the money. Like, and, and it's about um, making a living. So that's my question to you guys and to all of you guys. Is this idea that uh, we can have a, an artist middle class where artists can make their work as work um, actually possible? considering what all the opportunities that the digital age um, have put forth. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that you kind of got to the, to the bigger question and the bigger point, which I think the answer is definitely yes. But, you know, it, it, it really, all these things that we've talked about and all these, you know, record labels shutting down sites and all these preventions and, and different things is, you know, is copyright there to enable an artist middle class, or is copyright there to stop people from consuming music? You know, to give you control over, you know? And, and I mean, I approach it firmly from the belief that copyright there was to enable, you know, to have an artist middle class and also to enable there to be more art in society. I mean, that's, that's the way I've always looked at it, is that art is good and the world's a better place when we have all kinds of art, and art everywhere, it's fantastic. And and so therefore, that's what I look to copyright to really do, is enable people to monetize that so that they're encouraged, they can make a living off it and create more art. And I think that we kind of sort of tipped the scale at one point. Um, back in the, you know, mp3.com, Napster, right in that whole area where everybody was having a knee-jerk reaction from MTV, which I think MTV was actually kind of the main thing that, that the record company said, we will not let this happen again, hmm. you know? And, and at that point, you know, copyright became this great barrier for consumption of of art in society. And the minute that happens, then the monetization goes away and then the whole thing starts to unravel and that's where we are today. Uh, personally, I would say I, I'm quite optimistic that it will happen because I think it will become a more sane. And I think that the once you cut out a lot of the intermediaries between the creator and the user, you have a chance of a greater chunk of the money going uh, directly to those people. I mean, bearing in mind that on a record, if the creators of the record get 10% of the retail price of a CD, you're doing very well. And that ch figure has not gone up online. And that, to me, is also scandalous. I mean, if anything, it's gone down. The iTunes deal, the record companies, are certainly in the UK, have managed to work it out that they pay even less on a download as a proportion of the, the, the revenue than they do on a physical record, which I find really hard to understand. But I do have to take my hats off to them that they've managed to have the <laughs> bottle to work it out in that way. Cool. Alec, Congratulations. Sorry, Alec, any, uh, any last statement? No, I mean, I think, uh, I think what Peter and David uh, just mentioned, uh, to, uh, to utilize the services on the internet um, and find some sort, of, some sort of balance is the only possible way, you know, some sort of balance within these, uh, uh, this technology. Uh, is the only way for a medical, middle class to exist, I think. Uh, otherwise, I mean, you're really, everybody's rolling the dice as, as usual and either getting lucky or not. And uh, I think there is an opportunity to, uh, to find that balance and actually everybody can sort of exist on an equal footing, really. Cool. Let's stop there. I always like it when the artist has the last word. Uh, Justin, Alec, Peter, and David, thank you very much for a great panel. <laughs> And thank you, Derek, for leading this wonderful final panel we have today. Um, so here we are at the end of the day, and I'd like to thank you all for coming and participating in today's program. Um, I'd like to also thank our sponsors who make some of this programming possible. And to remind you that after this, we can all head over to the Black Cat, which is on 14th uh, between S&T, right, um, for a cocktail party from 6 till uh, 8 o'clock or so. Uh, following that, there's a show at the Black Cat with Lamb Chop, which is a band from Nashville, if people are hanging around. And Marcy Wagman from Drexel told me that um, one of the bands that's signed to Mad Dragon, Hoots and Hellmouth, is playing at the uh, Rock and Roll Cafe tonight. No, Rock and Roll Hotel, sorry, to Cafe tonight, <laughs> Rock and Roll Hotel as well. So um, just some reminders to people. We really appreciate you um, evaluating the programming today. 
there were evaluation slips put in the programs, but there's also more at the front desk. If you've tried, had a chance to fill it out, there's a box out on the registration table. If you could just, just deposit them there, we'd really appreciate it. And we do take all, all your feedback really seriously on how we move ahead with programming in the future. Speaking of programming in the future, we're looking forward to our next policy summit, which is our bigger sort of two to three day version of programming like this, which is much more comprehensive. We'll be doing it in Washington, D.C. in October, most likely October 4th through 6th. Um, uh, if you uh, want to recycle your badges, you can drop them off at the registration table. Um, we did, we were very successful today with our live webcasting. Um, experiment. Um, Deja, back at the table, has been live webcasting through the Webalicious website. That's web.illish.us. We've been working with Webalicious on a um, series of, sh of shows in Philadelphia that have been or uh, organi organized around net neutrality and um, the our Rock the Net campaign. And we are final episode of Webalicious is happening next Wednesday, February 18th. At Silk City, it involves um, a panel discussion interweaved with a show, and it's also live webcast at Webalicious. Um, and I think, oh, shout out to Drexel students. Marcy Wagon brought down like 40 students from Drexel University's music industry program. So um, <laughs> on a bus. So we really appreciate all the students who are here from the other schools as well. We really like you all to be uh, part of the programming and to our musicians, scholarship winners who are here today as well. So thanks again for coming, and we hope to see you at the next event.